Hi, um, welcome to the last talk on Saturday tonight in the Blue Saloon at the GPN 21. JavaScript or Java has some nice functionalities and one of them is those little tiny agents. They can do a lot of work. They can help programmers, engineers to make the work easier and fix things and make code more beautiful. Johannes is showing how this works and how he uses it in his daily work at SAP. He's a, J he's a Java developer and is going to explain those Java agents. Um, I see some tools from the hardware store. I see some materials, some screws, some pieces of wood. I'm very excited how he's going to use this in his explanations. Applause to Johannes. <laughs> Take us away. Thank you for a kind introduction. So, um, without further ado, I want to start with a small example. So, consider I'm now not a speaker or Java developer or whatever, but I'm a frame builder. I come to people's houses and I want to build frames. So, essentially, a client came to me and said, I have these, have these precious images because I like them at my home. Um, and I want to have a frame. And I'm like, cool, I'm a frame builder. I can build frames. I come to him and say, like, here's the what. Cool. And I think, like, yeah, I probably need, need screws too. And I need some nails too. And I need a drill bit. So maybe put a drill bit. And I need a power drill because, like, I want to drill these, 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 these pieces of wood together. And probably that's also good. And I need a hammer to put it on at the end. <laughs> So I, I'll need a hammer. There's, there's one hammer in, so that's, that's probably fine. I just take it with me. So, but, and then I come to a client, and the client is like, you, you, you only wanted the hammer and took this with you? Because essentially, I would need, and I took this all with my small carriage and drove it toward all of the city, but it could fit in my backpack. If I just had like pulled out the hammer, pulled out the power drill, pulled out everything, um, so essentially, what I want is, I want to pull out just the things that I will need. So in the end, um, I would just keep a backpack. But the software developer, what does the software developer do? He uses something like Spring, and Spring depends on like everything, the whole world. is like, the software developer thinks like, yeah, I, I need a collection. So probably I use an Apache collection, but in this one instance, the Eclipse Collections framework is a tiny, tiny, tiny bit better. So I pull just in the whole Eclipse Collections framework, and Guava has some quite nice P maps. So probably just pull them in too. And so in the end, we we get a large, large, large um, uh, application which has hundreds of megabytes of dependencies, and it's like with all all the power tools. We only needed a hammer. I put out a real a whole box of things where we have screwdrivers and everything, which I never n need. But as a software developer, I don't care. I pull the garage with me if I can. I pull the whole house. And even in some languages, I pull like the whole city with me. But as a carpenter, I really care. So why don't we care? The thing is, it's a bit harder. So um, we probably don't need all this. So if we now consider that we are that that we software architects, so if we would build buildings, then it would be like at the beginning we had an Alpha Tower. That's nice, but we need a clock in the city somewhere. So yeah, we we'll take a clock, put it on. Then we need some housing, so maybe put some housing on top. That that's fine. And then we need we need a carnival. We need uh we we need some attractions. Just put them on, and that's like. Thank God, not everything is software. If it would be, it would be quite horrible. Um, because in the end, um, and that's a quote from a paper um, by by Soto Valero, the software grows and grows and grows naturally, and in the end, it accumulates not only like code lines but also bugs and security risks. And so, it's a major, major effort to deep load the software. So, but but how do we do this? So there are different types of deep loading. Essentially, we have dynamic and static deep loading tools. Um, depending on like dynamic, is it runs besides the programs, 
and static is we pre-analyze. So for static, it's quite easy, and we can just use code analysis. That's okay. I try to do a PhD in this field. It works, but don't use reflection. Reflection is for code analysis, a magic bullet that kills it, because the first time you have like reflection that gets a string into it, and the code analysis is like, yeah, I don't know anything about the string, then the reflection code ex access every class, and probably also every method. So that's has its has disadvantages. Um, then you have dependency analysis tools, that, but that's a whole other topic. And with dynamic tools, you have either coverage-based, so you know coverage-based testing, uh, coverage testing. Um, you run your whole test suite and then look which methods are used. That's quite interesting, and there's also like profiling-based. Um, and that's why I come on, because I'm like a profiler guy. So I work at SAP, I do some profiles, according to the slides that I'm on. Um, and I work at Submachine. It's a large, it's a quite large open source team. We're like 15 people working at the open JDK at SAP. We're the third biggest contributor there. And uh, for example, if you want to know something about PowerPC, we have the lead on PowerPC for OpenJDK and or the JDK 17 updates maintainer. And they have, of course, stickers here with our nice ZAP machine. Um, so what I regularly do when I don't do uh, talks and don't work on like deep loading, I work on profiling, for example, creating profiling UIs, creating, helping to create profiles, and also working on like internal stuff in the JVM. So how did I came to, to work on profiling. It's, it's simple. I was at a conference in, um, in London in March and someone asked me like, hey, you, has, you have this article on um, Hacker News that's quite high up. And it was an article that I wrote under the channel. It's called Writing a Java Profile and uh, 204 Lines of Your Java. And then he said like, hey, uh, there's a paper out there. It's called Coverage Based Bloating for Bytecode. Any opinions on this? Have you thought about deploting any time? And I was like, ha, ha, you know, probably nerd sniping, where, where, where in this famous XKD, someone asks the physicists a complicated question, and the train comes by and crushes him. I was like the same, like, you know, the JVM, could you help us deploy using ancient and profiles? And I'm like, Oh, but it, it was good. I, I was in a bed in London. It was small. London is an expensive city, so I didn't get hurt. I'm here now. So um, because I thought like existing tools have problems, coverage-based tools have problems, all these tools have problems. And one of them, they are quite complicated. These are tools written and uh, described in research papers with long abstracts, with long everything. I couldn't understand. I could understand them, yes, but I couldn't really understand why they should work properly because they were just too long. The implementations that I found on some tools were like thousands of thousands of lines of code and you could ask, are they bloated too? But that's another opinion of de-bloating. It's another thing of de-bloating the de-bloating code. So essentially, I thought I could just write my own because how hard could it be? People doing their PhDs on this topic, but hey, I have two days of leisure time in London, so maybe. and. Maybe I get out a small blog post on it because I blog like every two weeks and so I thought, hey, I need another blog post, maybe do this. And so the person that asked me was actually a person from SAP Security Research. Um, so he was interested. So of course, it's a prototype what you're seeing here. So we first reduce the problem because that's the first step in everything that you should do. So. Of course, we could find like f unused method and anything, but that's quite hard. And my main idea was when a user uses or when, when the code uses a method from a class, then it's highly likely that all the other methods are probably also used um, in there somewhere. And also depending on like how, how methods of this class are called, it's highly likely that many of the other methods would be called because otherwise you could quite easily catch this with, with static tools. So I thought like, hey, maybe it's okay to just find unused classes. And that's the whole idea here. This makes it far simpler. So to find unused classes, it's quite simple. We first have to, of course, know the classes that are there, but we can just look at the jar and see, yay, this class was loaded, or yay, this class is yeah, like lying around in the bytecode. So we know this. But how do we know um, an unused class? Any ideas, an, a used class? And because we can then say, oh, we know the used classes, we know the overall classes. 
Um, then we know the unused classes. Any idea how we could easily check or see that class A is used? Uh, record at runtime that the class A is used. Any idea here, my large audience? Could we insert there some code? Yes. Ooh. So the idea is essentially in the back uh, for those who, who didn't hear it. Um, it's essentially, yeah, do static analysis. That's cool, but we are here dynamically because static analysis has its problem, as I explained before. Any ideas how we could do this? Yes. So the answer was essentially this, that's cool. It was like, hey, you're doing a talk on instrumentation, so maybe you instrument the class, and yes, we have some bright people in the audience. Uh, that, that's always cool. So essentially what we're doing, we have static initializers because they are used uh, a lot of time, they're called a lot of times, for example, and I uh, use, and I like to use the uh, language specification because that's a great source of truth in, many petty arguments that you have with your colleagues at small companies like is this an expression is the dot an expression and you can look in the java language specification and tell the other person that it is or it isn't and nobody cares but yay uh, so essentially here when when our static initializer is called essentially every time a class is used and every time um, a child class of a class is used and that's pretty neat because that's essentially what we want and that's easy because we can just like instrument and that's fine. So the problem is now interfaces. Question to the audience, is this legal? Could we place this code here? Uh, who of the audience thinks, yes, this is legal Java? Who thinks that isn't Java? Ooh, the majority says it isn't Java, and that's cool, uh, because it's right, it's forbidden in Java, because Java is like this little-known language that has some things written in the Java language specification and other things written in the bytecode specification. So this is allowed in bytecode, but is, isn't allowed in, um, in, in Java, at least as far as I can understand. But the cool thing, I only care about bytecode, because bytecode is far cooler, just write everything in bytecode doesn't lead to any maintenance hell at all. It's like writing assembly. Assembly was the time. I have colleagues that wrote like systems in assembly when they started. They started before I got by before I was born, so that was interesting. Now um the the, the thing here, um what we then get is that we have to deal with interfaces a bit differently because the problem is when an interface is like accessed, we don't access also the the state initializers for the parent interfaces aren't called, so we have to deal with this, but that's quite feasible. We can just walk the, the, the trees, the inheritance trees. So essentially what we get, we get the plot we, we got the classes found in the bytecode by the instrumentation. On the one hand, we get some recorded classes. Uh, oh, so so we, yes, we have, um, and we got some recorded classes, these that are like used there. And then in the middle, we have um, the bloat classes here and then the used classes. The important thing is that they are used classes that aren't in the bytecode directly, aren't in the char, for example, lambda, the classes for lambdas or classes that are generated uh, dynamically, like by mocking frameworks or probably also by Spring. Um, but what to do with this information? So one idea would be to just remove the plot classes. This is interesting because it drastically reduces the size of, uh, of jars. Even um, with this example, it can, even with, with this quite coarse approach that only deals with classes, we can reduce it. So uh, the, the size. But the problem is when we remove it and then we run it in production and then someone accesses the class by chance because we're only, um, we're only being dynamically, we're only recording new classes dynamically so we don't actually know what classes could be used at all. So in, in rare circumstances, some other class could be used that we just didn't hit in during testing. So the idea is we don't remove it, but 
um, for these classes that we know shouldn't be used, so that we can ignore them, for example, for security warnings and else, um, we can just log an error and then decide on the error or decide in this code here what to do with them. For example, we could like cr cr uh, crash the server or we could alert someone or we could stop it or pass it to another system. And it's quite nice because then we we deal with deploading from a security perspective, of course it doesn't reduce the size of the actual binary, but we have to decide whether we want like real size reduction or whether we want certainty that the server doesn't crash in production. So in production, I would like servers to have a high uptime. Um, so now for something completely different, yay, it's implementation time, uh, because the implementation is the thing that I'm interested in. I'm more an engineer than I'm a scientist, so the structure here of this code is, is quite large, because it's an interesting problem, but essentially what we're doing, we're recording first uh, with our agent, all, um, we're instrumenting, recording all classes that are used, and then produce a file called classes.txt or something else, and then use this information to either put it in the agent back, and so say, the next time you're instrumenting, please instrument these classes that we know shouldn't be used with this like lock, or we use uh, or we use um, a, a, some some code that just removes these classes. The problem is that with string, there are some problems um, with getting all, with instrumenting all classes. I don't know why. Maybe some class loader shenanigans. Spring is interesting because they use lots of class. They they use some class laws. They use some reflection. So uh, for this, we then um, instrument it directly. So we instrument it jar and not at runtime, but that's essentially the same. We're, we're doing the same, but just before um, uh, running the code um, and else at runtime. Uh, so how is the agent structured? We have a main class, of course, that's like the entry point. We have then a class transformer um, that transforms classes. This is then called by the every time a class is uh, loaded. Uh, and then we have a store that stores this information and produces us with the information which classes are unused, which are used. Um, so, but uh, we have one problem with this structure. Con consider this here again. We have our class A, that, that's fine. Class A lives, um, lives here in, in the same space as the store, so it's apparent that uh, when we instrument it, class A can access the store. The problem is now, with, with class string. Class string is like an internal class, so it cannot really access the store class when we add it because um, of the class load hierarchy. So um, class load is something that loads classes, so we have a few of them and they form a hierarchy. So for example, when uh, the child class loader doesn't know a class, it asks this parent class loader, hey, can you load this? for me. And so we have the bootstrap class loader with everything like strings and inter uh, strings and integer classes and so on. And then we have the platform classes which contain more of the broader um, JVM internal classes and then we have your app class loader. And the problem is, um, and then probably some more. And, and the problem is here that it's quite easy, it's quite feasible that something from the class app loader um, from, from the app class loader can access other classes in Bootstrap because we're doing this already. We, we're accessing from our application like string, integer, and everything, all these nice classes. But the problem is the other way around is difficult because like the Bootstrap class loader can't ask his parent class loader like, give me this class because the parent class loader is like, which class? So there should be a way around this and of course, um, we can just tell, uh, we, we can just package the store because that's the only thing that we really need that the bootstrap class will, will ever want to access um, into a runtime jar and then can just ask the bootstrap loader, hey, please also look when you didn't find a class, please also look into this jar. And that's quite nice because then um, everything works. Yay. And how can we implement this? Essentially, um, uh, Every agent is passed an object of class instrumentation, which has an aptly named method, aptly named method. Append to bootstrap class loader search. Yes, Java people like long names, but I think when you ever wrote some Spring application, you know that you can only by name tell that something is 
belongs to string. And so essentially we can just append it and that's fine. But now back to the agent itself. How can we write an agent? So we know main methods here in, in Java, for example, we can use the main string args. We can also like put the square brackets behind the args because yay, it's Java. And uh, uh, with the new Java version, um, Java 21, it's also possible to write this, but this doesn't really fit agents because um, agents can be attached either at, st at the start of an application or later, um, because the agents are just like simple tools um, that run besides your code. And so uh, there's a method called agent main that's called when you attach it later, and there's a method called pre main that's attached to the beginning. And that's quite nice because um, we can distinguish these. But the problem is here, of course, instrumentation is missing, but there's a variant where it's also get past the instrumentation. And instrumentation, these, these objects contain a lot of uh, methods that are useful for instrumentation. For example, as, as I told you before, like the append to class loader, to boot class loader search, or methods to get to retransform classes, which is, is quite nice. So essentially what we're doing, we are passing the options somehow, we are pending to the bootstrap class loader path, search path, and then we're adding a transformer, and that's the critical part. Um, um, this allows us, uh, this, this, this transformer, as, as quoted here, the documentation, um, has a method called transform, uh, and this method gets passed um, every t uh, gets gets passed like the class loader that the class belongs to the class name a class object um, when the class is like retransformed because we can either transform a class that we loaded so this class loader this class transformer is is executed whenever a class is loaded and um, if we set it to do so when we call a class to be retransformed, um, which is quite nice. And so essentially the, the important parts are here class name and the class file buffer. It's just like the bytecode of the class. And then we have to deal with this. So what I found through um, some, some errors that I got, it's really healthy if you just throw away a lot of classes and don't instrument them at all. Because it makes life so it makes life so much easier. Of course, you could later, when you put more effort into uh, into it, transform them. But for example, it's helpful to not transform any of your own classes from the agent because, like, you could end in quite nasty endless loops. And I found also that like the JDK internal libraries aren't a trade to instrument, and also the Sun part, which is like the JDK internal internal things, are not also that great and Sadly, I had also to pull out um, the, the Java package just because I got so many errors. Yes, it's possible to deal with this, but no, not in the uh, time that I got for this for this tool. So essentially, how can we then transform the bytecode? Yes, we could write bytecode. I like bytecode, you probably too. It's the nicest language ever produced. The only problem is you got lots of bugs when you write it, and I tried to, during my time doing my PhD, I tried to analyze bytecode, I wrote a lot of it, and it was interesting. And the problem is, you probably don't have time and you don't want to tell someone that reviews your code, like, hey, uh, that's a cool idea that I wrote like this many custom bytecode. So essentially, you, you grab the next best tool, and that's Java Assist. It's a tool that belongs to the JBoss family of tools. Um, has, it, it's there, as it says, since, since a long, long time. It's one of the oldest uh, tools in this area, and essentially it allows us to write something like, uh, please create me a class initializer on this class, and please insert this Java code. And as you see here, um, you can just write Java code. That's quite interesting and quite fast. And to write, but of course you pay the price that every time you transform it, the uh, uh, Java Assist library has to pass this Java code. But usually you wouldn't run it in production, which is cool. And usually also it doesn't really matter um, that much. Hopefully you don't have too many classes, but in the end you're deploting, so you probably have. Um, how to use it? It's quite simple. I use here the, pet spread the, the Spring Pet Clinic, and you just call in Java agent by, saying, by, by passing it to Java. You can pass it some arguments. For example, here, where should it store these classes? 
um, and then run your application and then you get something like this. You get, for example, that the class pattern later encoder is used and the class drawer and configurator, whatever, is just loaded. And you can then use this to pass this back again into my instrument into my instrumenter or into code that removes it. And here I just instrumented it so it locked classes that weren't previously used and then worked on the paddling and clicked the where it clicked on some different buttons and then it told me like, hey, these classes are not allowed. And so that's the logging. And that's that's for the bloating here, but there are of course other application of other applications of agents. So would will recommend when you have a small problem, when you have a problem at work, just just try out some agents. Just try to write your own agent. Um, for example, you could use it to write a profile um, quite easily, like in around 200 follow lines of code and that's all from my side here thanks for being here i'm part of mod on twitter and you can you can read uh, every two weeks a nice blog post on java and also some of you might be here tomorrow where i'm also giving a talk on uh, in uh, on do you trust your profiles i once did too so thanks for all your audience here Any questions? Do we do we have a microphone to pass around? I think that makes it easier, so I don't have to repeat all this, all the questions. Test. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you recommend a good introduction into Java agents, for example, a tutorial? Uh, is, is of course, I could remind, I could uh, recommend um, my blog posts on this topic. Yeah. I think typically um, there's some good ones from Oracle, and also there's some good ones from Beidong out there. I would just recommend uh, going to my article. I link these there. Um, so I think the best introduction is just to work on it. So just to just to pick another agent that does something similar and copy it because my code is MIT licensed, so you can just grab it. So that's an example for an instrumentation agent. I also wrote a profiler, which is like an example for an uh, application that runs alongside. Um, so I would start with this and then just modify it. That's the way I'm doing it. So when I created this class transformer, my first approach was like, I copy my old code into a new project, rename it, and then worked on it. Uh, and then I had some error messages, I googled them and that fixed it because Stack Overflow, yay. That's how you do professional uh, development. Also in your OpenJDK, and I want to add that um, in the beginning I was introduced as a Java developer. That's not that right, I'm an OpenJDK developer. Yes, I do sometimes write Java, but I usually write the JVM, so I'm kind of a Java developer but in a different sense that many people, so, so I'm working on Java, not with Java. I like to write Kotlin, it's a nice language. Uh, so anyhow, anyhow, yes, in the back there's also someone who likes Kotlin, but the, sadly when you work on OpenJK, you have to write Java because in the OpenJK people like Java. I don't know why, maybe because it's like the open Java development kit, but that's a whole nother story. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh. <laughs> then again? <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know if, uh, how your tool performs with annotations? Ooh, interesting. So, uh, if I'm honest, I didn't look into this. It might be interesting, yes, because annotations and the whole part of like preprocessors that add to your code, that's a whole different class of errors and that's a whole different topic. I think with the instrumentation agent, it shouldn't be that problematic because we're still getting all new classes when an annotation creates a new class. It's still interesting, but I think there, there needs to be some further research. So that's only a prototype and there is some there, there are some people who, you, who try to work on my code and look into my code and do this more properly. I just spent like a few days on it and so yeah, hopefully there's something. I think in the back is a question or? You previously said that um, the time passing the Java code you gave to the bytecode generator was actually annoying even in development. Going back to annotations, have you considered using annotation, using annotation processes to actually generate the bytecode in the compilation step <laughs> 
because you can use Java doing that and then insert that later on. Um, yes, I, I considered using like preprocessors or, or tools like this or just tell Java Assist like, please give me the bytecode, please give me like the thing that you parsed and uh, deal with it. I think Java Assist probably allows it because Java Assist is used by so many applications. So I considered this, but the problem in the end was I didn't want to spend too much time because it's still a prototype and please don't use this in production. It might kill your application in the whole world. I don't guarantee for anything. It's just the, all the tools that I'm writing, like also the profile that I wrote, um, which helped to begin this whole story, they are for educational purposes. You could use them in production if you're really sure what you're doing. With the profile, I'm sure that it's kind of working. There was even someone in, in Milan where I gave a talk on this. He was like, oh, we, we, I'm a consultant and at our company where I'm currently working. We cannot use a profile, but I can insert code. So I can just insert your Java code, your, your prototypical Java code to profile application. And that was like, um. <laughs> so, Yes, you could maybe work on it, but I think when you like to work on this and make it more efficient, please go on. It's MIT lessons, it's on GitHub, and I'm happy for any contributions. So many questions for my large audience. <laughs> yes, okay. If, is it possible to instrument methods? Java too. Um, yes, so so what you can do here, um, the two things for uh, for one, you can of course you you get here a class, so you can add m code to methods. For example, here we're essentially doing this. We're adding methods. We we're, we're adding code to a static initializer. The problem is that some classes cannot be extended this way. A, co a good example is when you have native methods. I methods implemented in, in C++ code, there are a few around because methods like system point current time millis, where it got into a real rabbit hole to, to see which time source it uses. Yes, it uses a different time source than system point nano time, but that's a whole different story. So um, there are some methods that you cannot extend. Um, so that's quite problematic. And the other thing is that here in this example, it won't work that well because method chronology was to find more me. But yes, uh, with regular Java methods, you can just work on them as you like. Uh, so you could even, I, I think you, oh, can you remove methods? I think you can, but you can probably just remove the body of a method and replace it with throw help. So, and this was also an idea that, that came up during my research that I could just, instead of logging all, instead of logging at a class, at, at like the initializer, I could also just use all methods and uh, replace them by throw new runtime exception. But I didn't do it in the end, as I said, it's just a prototype. Try it out, maybe it gives you better examples, uh, better results. Uh, wouldn't it be possible to uh, take the hotspot optimized uh, bytecode and compare it with your results? So maybe there are more dynamic analysis results from the Java <laughs> internals directly? For, for one thing, I think, as, uh, so as far as I know the hotspot, I'm not a hotspot developer when I have hotspot. Uh, questions I asked some colleagues because I have colleagues who are like 20 years in this field, but um, you don't have the bytecode. The bytecode isn't really optimized. The bytecode is transformed, in, as far as I know, into a different set of, of uh, instructions, and this is then optimized because the bytecode is interesting for writing it down. It's a short format, but it's not that great for actually optimizing. Just ask the the, the person next to you who probably should should know something about optimizing, I hope. Uh, yes, there's a question in the back. How does this interact with Java 9 based uh, optimization? Because with Java 9 and later with the proper module framework, you can even split the JVM and build like the one specific split of the class and modules you need. Um, how much of that um, could you already use to throw out a large part of the classes that you would interact with? You could use it, of course. Uh, you could use it, um, especially for all the JDK-related classes. The main problem is, does anyone use the module system this way? So that's the module system was this like great revolution, but nowadays, 
I just see it as a hurdle for people coming from Java 8 to Java 11. So I think it's it's no secret that like many people still use Java 8. There are even companies uh, adding, uh, having support for Java 7. And I heard of cases where Java 5 and 6 are used. So I think m the module system is a whole new topic. And the problem is on the module system, there isn't that much documentation. Um, and I think, um, by my being correct, that the module system is just too complicated for people to use. So, yes, you could use it, but no, it's far easier to just throw out the code um, like this. And also, as I said, the module system is restrained to the um, whole JDK. It's mm, Yes, you can use it for your own applications, but I'm unsure whether, for example, Spring has fine-grained modules. And the whole thing about how fine-grained it should be, it's, it's hard. and where I encounter module systems most is like when I want to use in non-Java 8, so in, in higher versions, um, some some internal Java APIs, and I have to add like, hey, please open this module for me. And it's especially weird when you have like bugs in, in build systems. For example, I had once a bug that was quite annoying. I wanted to add like modules that I wanted to use to uh, um, to an uh, Eclipse-based project, which used Maven Tycho, and I couldn't add, for whatever reasons, these um, add open module or whatever statement. So what I had to do was, inter was to prefix it with a non with a normal option like minus version and then the thing because then Myvan Tycho could parse it. So um, that shows you that like still even build systems have sometimes problems with, with this. And I think I, I proposed, I, I told the Myvan Tycho people like there's a problem, could you please fix it? I think they fixed it now, but I'm unsure. So yeah, you Maven Taisho. Um any other questions? Then, then thanks for your audience here. Um, if you want to read more on this whole topic, I've I've got an article um, out there, um, and just ask me when you have other travel-related questions. And come to my talk tomorrow at I think it's at one o'clock. Then goodbye and good night.